Hiya! Thank you for joining me for this video. Uh, this is going to be a bit more of a serious topic to discuss today. I wanted to talk about something that's affected me personally and something which I know affects a number of different people. Um, it can manifest itself in various different ways. Um, as always, when I talk about anything that's a little bit more serious and is, I guess, in the area of giving advice, I just want to make clear right from the top that anything I talk about today comes pretty much exclusively from my personal experience, from how I have um, experienced aspects of life, aspects of uh, the way our society works. And again, I'm talking about a UK based society. I'm, uh, I guess I'm pretty privileged in terms of how I was brought up, how I grew up and how I experienced the world when I was younger. But even saying that, there are, there are obviously parts of how I grew up that didn't exactly give me the ideal environment, um, particularly given the type of person that I am. So as a young cross-dresser, young trans person, you know, in that wider trans person group, which is a very wide community, there are all sorts of us, as you'll know if you uh, if you go out to attend any sort of trans evenings, there is no way you can put your finger on someone to say that is what a trans person looks like. Um, we're a very diverse community and, you know, we, there are plenty of us within our community who, you know, look down on other people or subgroups within our community. Um, and as a result, it's not always easy to find uh, what I would call the ideal help that is right for you. And I think a lot of people spend quite a lot of time f trying to work things out on their own, reaching out to people, maybe getting knocked back, and struggling to find the right outlet for how to discuss or deal with how they're feeling. And some of that can manifest itself in, in various different ways. One thing I can't talk about and certainly wouldn't even wouldn't even claim to talk about is gender dysphoria. Now, uh, if I give you my take on that very, very quickly, just to sort of set the scene, I don't think of myself as having gender dysphoria. I don't think of myself as being particularly, today, particularly um, conflicted in any way about who I am. I feel quite centered. I feel, to use a terrible term, I feel quite uh, comfortable with who I am. And my only concerns that are left are with how people perceiving me will affect the experiences of my immediate family. So as of right now, I'm not really bothered about how other people um, see me. I'm not really bothered about how the general public might view myself. I feel that what I am is what I am, and I am uh, doing no one any harm. And in consequence, how I choose to live my life is basically up to me. And if I want to do this from time to time, even though you won't have seen this, but I present very, very differently for most of my life, uh, when I want to do this, um, it's no different than, a, than a, a hobby. And that means that for me, I think I don't fit into that category of person who is unable to connect with the body they're born in, who is unable to, um, to ex uh, let's say, to, to reconcile themselves with who they know themselves to be inside, with who they present as outwardly, how their body appears to other people. I can't connect with that. I'm not even sure I'm using the right terms. I wouldn't claim to be an expert on this. And I certainly would hope that anyone listening to this um, would at least... Uh, give me a little bit slack in understanding that I've never taken the time to uh, to go into any more depth on this on the right way to express these feelings because I haven't had to. Having said that, while I don't think of myself as possessing or being affected by gender dysphoria, I have to recognise that of my life I've made a number of decisions, I've made a number of ways of expressing myself that are clearly, I think, linked to the way I feel comfortable to express my gender. 
And that has manifested itself in the most obvious way by the fact that on a daily basis I hide a, a large important part of my life from most of the people I associate with. I hide it from my work, I hide it from, um, uh, from some friends and family and my local community. And I've done that for my whole life. I did that when I was at university, I did it at school. So I, I, uh, I knew I was, um, well, I had um, sort of clear leanings in this direction from uh, my adolescence, from sort of 11, 12 years old, maybe even a little bit earlier. And, you know, I, I knew that I was interested in things that weren't, um, that weren't, widely seen in my peer group community. Amongst the boys and girls that I grew up around, um, this wasn't something that seemed to affect other people. It may well have done in private, but it wasn't, um, wasn't publicly um, communicated, wasn't publicly displayed. And that's something that has affected me since I was, uh, since I was really young. Um, I've uh, I've hidden away parts of this. I've occasionally revealed some of these to people who some of my sort of um, you know, desires in presenting as female on occasions. And I've had mixed success, um, but these are partnerships or relationships that have since faded away and are no longer part of my active life. And over times I've made new friends, lost friends, um, because of some communication of these types of issues. And more importantly, I've mainly lost friends because of how I have dealt with the internalization of who I wanted to be. So, as you'll know from the subject of this title, the main thing I was going to talk about today is alcoholism. So, this is something I'm pretty open about in my um, my daily life. So it's not this isn't a big revelation moment for me to talk about this. I talk about this relatively often. Uh, but I view myself as an alcoholic, not as a recovering alcoholic. I view myself as an alcoholic um, to this day. Now, I haven't drunk alcohol since the 18th of August 2005. I know the day, I'll never forget the day um, when I last drank alcohol. Uh, it's one of those moments that's kind of burned into you. So I think of myself as being uh, still an alcoholic to the extent that uh, I have no proof otherwise than that this fact is true, that if I were to drink alcohol again, I would drink all the alcohol available to me and I would be unable to resist drinking more alcohol. So for me, it's either abstinence or all the alcohol. There's no in between, I can't moderate. So I have no sense of moderation when it comes to alcohol whatsoever. I never have. And um, for me, the only thing that's likely to stop me uh, from drinking anymore is either running out of alcohol, and you know, you go to extraordinary lengths to make sure that's not gonna happen, um, or passing out. Those are the only two sort of, um, sort of circumstances. So, um, alcoholism and how that's affected me. So back in my uh, 20s and 30s, I drank very heavily. I was drinking around about uh, two to three bottles of wine, mostly red, um, a night, somewhere in that region, um, two, three bottles a night and uh, functioning. So functioning within my work, functioning with some of my relationships. So I would drink alcohol um, all night until basically I passed out. I'd then wake up the next morning by my alarm and would clean myself up and go into work. And then when I left work, I'd go home via the off-license, buy a couple of extra bottles of wine, um, a good one to start me off, and then a couple of cheap ones. And that way I'd always have enough alcohol to basically ensure that the cycle would continue for the next day. One of my biggest concerns at the time was actually running out of alcohol. The idea of, of running out of alcohol, let's say on a Sunday with the off licenses closed or something, and not being able to get hold of alcohol. 
Um, I worked out a emergency measure to deal with that. Um, at one point where I was living, there was a local um, pizza delivery company who would deliver um, a bottle of wine with your pizza. And on many occasions, I have ordered a meal deal with pizza that I didn't want in order to get the bottle of wine delivered to me so I didn't have to leave the house um, blind drunk. So that was my um, yeah, part of how I, I dealt with things was to drink. I started drinking when I was probably about, no, I'd say about 14, 15 years old. And by that I mean buying a bottle of uh, 2020 or Thunderbird. Uh, Kiwi and lemon, I think, was the 2020 flavour. It's hideous stuff. It's like mouthwash. It's like uh, aftershock today. It's a terrible, terrible drink. But I used to, uh, I used to buy a bottle of that and I sort of sit and drink it at home. As a, you know, as a boy, as a uh, young man. And... I was quite unhappy in my school life. Um, I was um, fairly heavily bullied uh, when I was at school. I was younger than most people in my class, smaller than most people in my class, and I was a bit of a smart house. Um, I was um, very sarcastic, or sarcasm developed as a result of bullying. Yeah, it happens. But I would, um, you know, I would sort of, um, I try and hurt people with words to counteract being um, hurt with fists, which was basically my life um, at school. I did pretty well at school, you know, I, eventually you leave and you realise that school isn't the be all and end all everything and um, you go off and I, I ended up, you know, living on my own and um, I was drinking very heavily, I drank very heavily all through university. I burnt a lot of bridges with people I knew at university because of my drinking. I burnt a lot of bridges. Um, I don't keep in contact with anyone that I lived with at university, um, mainly because you know, we've kind of gone our separate way these days, but also because at the time I was capable of some very dickish behaviour, very, very dickish behaviour. And yeah, I've, I've either been the sort of clown who takes it too far, or I've been the mean, um, sort of mean-spirited um, drunk who who I guess targets people for criticism, a lot of criticism, and looks to sort of expose weaknesses in people when they're drunk. So not good behaviour. I, I now see that as being a, um, an expression of my unhappiness with myself. I was overweight. Um, I wasn't dressing. I had packed a lot of leather weight, mainly because, frankly, I didn't think of myself as I didn't feel um, attractive. I didn't feel, um, I certainly wouldn't present as I would want to present myself. And so those were kind of dark days, about a decade of no real dressing, um, profound sort of unhappiness, unable to, uh, to connect with people, unable to maintain friendships, um, drinking myself to the point of illness. And that's where we come on to how I'm sort of affected by things today. So I drank myself into illness. I got to the point where I had developed, um, let's say, early symptoms of long-term diseases. And in particular, what I developed is gout. So I got to the point in, you know, my sort of rock bottom for me was um, getting an awful lot of gout in my ankles and I made myself susceptible um, in the future to a very, very painful sort of arthritic, associated with arthritis, but it's a swelling in the joints, um, uh, uric acid crystals that build up between the joints. It's incredibly painful, inflamed, the slightest touch is agony. It basically takes away any ability to sleep. Um, and on me, I developed uh, gout. And drinking would give me gout. Uh, heavy drinking. I could moderate it. And, you know, I, I, had, I lived with this for a good couple of years. Um, so I would cut back on drinking for a day or two in order to let the gout subside, start it up again, and I'd get flare-ups, all sorts of stuff. I'd be hobbling in around my office, trying to sort of convince people that I was generally healthy. Um, spending all my money on alcohol. 
which basically meant that I would give up on all sorts of things. Um, one Christmas, which was in Christmas 2004, the year before I gave up drinking, um, I turned up to family Christmas with no cards or presents for any of my family. Um, I started uh, shaving my, I bought a cheap pair of um, clippers to shave my head because I didn't want to waste money on hairdressing that could go towards alcohol. And so I basically put everything I could into that kind of, um, that kind of lifestyle. All of my money, uh, I would use my money up um, early in the month. I would have to, I had a relationship with an off license um, that would, you know, give me stuff on tab that I would pay back when I got, you know, I, I, I had all sorts of stuff going for me. Um, I had tax bills paid that I, uh, due that I didn't pay. And I got some help from someone who was very kind to help me out with that. But I came very close to, um, let's say, legal related issues to do with finances. And that's a world away from where I am today. And I know this is, this is you know, it's a lot of information, but it's a bit more about my backstory and how um, I feel that let's say a general sense of unhappiness, which a lot of us actually possess, can present itself as, you know, as, um, as something that we, we look for ways to, to hide, ways to cover up, ways to, uh, to, to blot out some of that emotion. I consider myself very lucky that I don't have gender dysphoria, um, or I don't believe I have based on where I am today. I think if I had it, the way that I cope with things, drinking, smoking, eating too much, I can imagine I would be, I would find my life far, far harder today to even be able to get rid of some of those crutches that I lent on when I was um, in my 20s. Um, when I entered my 30s, like I said, which was roughly uh, 2005, I... Um, I had a kind of watershed moment for myself. Um, I still wasn't dressing. I still wasn't expressing myself, but I'd reached what I would consider to be my rock bottom. And just want to talk for a second about how I dealt with that and what I did about that. Um, I tried to reach out for help, but I didn't want to reach out to a friend and family. I internalized a lot of my issues. I don't like to talk about things. I don't like to express myself. Um, you know, this is kind of anonymous what I'm doing here, I guess, but it's it's not something where I share my feelings with my family. It's not something I've I've ever really done, and so when I reached out, I reached out to anonymous sources. Um, I'd had a sort of bout of of the gout, very very bad, flared up, a lot of pain. Um, I was vomiting blood. Lovely video this. I was vomiting blood, and. Um, I wasn't eating very much, but I was still massively overweight. So at the time, I weighed about um, 16 stone, which I'm going to take a guess if I'm to do a certainty, which I guess would be around 90, 95 kilos. I don't know, something like that. No, more than that, probably over 100 kilos. So I weighed um, a, a fair bit. Um, it's 14 pounds in a stone. So um, what did I weigh? Uh, 160, 200. Um, I weighed over 200 pounds for the Americans watching. So I was quite heavy. Um, I was um, struggling with diet. And, you know, I was in a bad way physically. Pretty bad way. Overweight from drinking, too much eating, gout, health issues. Really quite worried about my future. And I reached out. So I reached out to... Uh, organizations. Um, one night whilst very drunk, um, I phoned the Samaritans. Now Samaritans are a, um, obviously they're a charity that is set up to deal with people who are, um, let's say, contemplating suicide. And I think I wasn't in that space, um, but I didn't, being drunk, I didn't really put a lot of thought into what I was doing. Um, it was more of a sort of reaction. And so I, um, yeah, I phoned the Samaritans. And I got some, um, 
I realised very quickly on the call that I wasn't going to get help. I was going to get sort of sympathy, and um, but it wasn't, let's say, a practical um, uh, practical way to address things. They were, I think, rightly so, they're geared up towards dealing with people who are um, actively contemplating suicide at that moment. And um, whilst I didn't get much from the call itself, and the next morning I um, I questioned why I felt it was the right thing to do anyway. Uh, it was useful to actually speak to someone. It was nice to be able to talk to someone, um, even a stranger, uh, which was important. I, the next night, I phoned Alcoholics Anonymous, and I spoke to a um, a really nice lady. And she talked to me about some of the issues, she gave me some information, she took down some details of me and uh, sent me some stuff through the post in relation to Alcoholics Anonymous and what it is. Um, I'll say very quickly, because I don't want to, I didn't do Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I read the information. Um, my atheism slash agnosticism uh, struggled with some of the concepts. And I, I kept the information as a possibility of what I was going to do, it's something I might do, but I didn't, um, I never felt drawn to it. It didn't seem to me to be the right thing to do, particularly for me. So, um, but I you know that night I found out I was still drinking. The following night, still drinking, I phoned again and uh, it was the same person and I hung up and what I realised from that is that what I wanted to do was I wanted to tell people, but I didn't want to speak to someone about it. I just wanted people to know. I wanted it to not be a, a known secret, you know. I think it's, I don't talk about it, but everyone really knows about it, but no one talks about it. I wanted it to be in the open. Um, you know, I phoned the AA again, the Alcoholics Anonymous again, and same person was there, and I didn't want to talk to the same person. I didn't want to... Uh, I wanted to, to talk to people about who I am, about being open. And that was a really interesting moment for me, because it helped me understand that I don't necessarily need to go through, you know, in-depth conversations. I don't need counselling. I just need to be honest. I need to acknowledge these things. I need to publicly acknowledge them. And the next day, um, which happened to be the 19th of August 2005, I went into my work and I told my manager that I was an alcoholic. And she was wonderful. I, I you know, I, I really love her. And, uh, um, you know, she was a um, really, really great help to me at the time. I told her I was an alcoholic. And she was great to talk to. She understood. And I told her that I didn't know what I would do, but I was going to try and quit drinking. And I might want to take some time to attend some Alcoholics Anonymous courses. Um, but that might mean me needing to leave work a little bit early a few days. And would that be okay? And she was completely supportive. Um, getting that out in the open and being able to tell someone about that part of my life was like a... Um, it was like letting off a pressure valve. It was like being able to, um, you know, almost like a, 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 a mist, the fog had started to clear. And so I, I, I told a couple of other people, but I told them after I'd been, I guess, four or five days without drinking. So I went four or five days without drinking and then I told a few more people. I said, look, just let you know, I'm... Um, I think of myself an alcoholic. Um, particularly, I needed to tell people who were inviting me to the pub, people I socialised with, people who, you know, wanted to go and watch the rugby, wanted to do whatever, and I couldn't, um, I couldn't socialise with them. I didn't trust myself in pubs. I was still smoking. Um, in my home life, I replaced the alcohol with Coca Cola, so. Instead of drinking three bottles of wine in the evening, I started drinking 
like a couple of litres of Coca-Cola. And then I realised that that was really unhealthy. So I switched to tea and I was drinking about eight cups of tea a night. Um, it was just something to do. I was, you know, I was bored at home. I'd normally sit at home getting drunk, playing computer or whatever. Um, and I needed something to do, uh, something to, you know, to occupy my hands. I was, I just needed to keep going getting drinks. Tea was a lot better for me than Coke, which was a lot better for me than alcohol. Um, so that was how I coped with a few things in the, um, in the early days. I had to cut off most relationships with friends. Um, I had some friends who, who understood, but I wasn't the, the funny guy anymore. Um, I wasn't able to enjoy myself in the same way. I found myself staring blankly at people who I previously would have found hilarious. Um, but now things weren't funny anymore. And I didn't know how to be sober in company. I didn't know how to cope in company without alcohol as a crutch to liven me up. I hadn't, weirdly enough, I hadn't developed good social skills at interacting with people outside of alcohol. I still suffer from that today. I can be quite difficult to get to know. And I'm quite standoffish in people. Um, I can talk on a subject, but I don't really engage with people as well as I'd like to. It's something I'm still working on now. Um, and given that most of the times when I go out these days, it's at trans venues or it's with other cross-dressers, other transgender uh, people, um, I still find it hard to connect with people because of this. And to talk sort of really and emotionally with people. I, I don't have a lot of friends and that's been by choice over my life because I didn't want people to you know to know who I am and know um, uh, know what I do. Hide things away. So my story basically is one of um, coping with drinking, coping with smoking, coping with food. I gave up the smoking um, about two months after I quit drinking. Um, another good reason not to go to the pub, because you, know, you could smoke inside in those days. So I gave up the smoking, and again, I haven't smoked since 2005. And I started to improve my health. I lost a lot of weight very quickly. I mean, I, the weight fell off me. I dropped down to under 13 stone. So I dropped down to um, what, I guess 170 pounds, something like that, um, quite quickly through not drinking as much. And I started to feel more confident, more happy with my physical appearance. And that's when the dressing thing emerged. It was like it had been suppressed in a cloud of drinking, in a cloud of um, of smoking and food and self-destruction and um, at times depression. Not clinical depression, I wouldn't describe it as clinical depression. I would describe it as self-inflicted depression, moping, um, very much feeling sorry for myself. And as that cloud cleared, as I communicated to people, as I told people who I was, um, I found things lifted, the fog lifted, and I was able to see a future, a uh, future for myself. And that was basically around about my 30th birthday. So I wasted a decade, I wasted my 20s, completely wasted my 20s. And only now, only then, sorry, at about 30 years old, did I find myself in a position where I could see a future for myself? I could see positive things. Um, I bought a flat, got my money issues sorted out, stopped wasting my money on things, started wasting my money on other things like, um, uh, well that's not a waste of money, on makeup and clothes and stuff and bits and pieces. And yeah, I started dressing again. And I started um, expressing myself and seeing myself differently. And I was on quite a different path at the time. 
I was headed towards um, probably more of a 50-50, 60-40 type uh, balance between my daily life and Juliet. Whereas now I'm more sort of 90% daily life, 10% Juliet. And yeah, I was in that kind of uh, kind of zone. But I found that um, being able to to be honest with myself and to articulate to someone the symptoms of who I was, the alcoholism, etc., got me to the point where I could start to see. Um, I could start to see a way to communicate who I really was, uh, communicate about the, you know, the the, the sort of um, the occasional woman, feminine side, that needed to be expressed, needed to be um, shared in some way, um, and that's something that probably took me another eight years. After that, to progress beyond the point where I was healthy, I was sober, I was um, presentable, I was not overweight, I was comfortable with how I appeared in my daily life, but it still took me a good eight years to then move to acknowledging that Juliet is a side of me that I want to be able to express publicly, not privately. And this is a, a, a journey that for me was interrupted by um, meeting my wife, who, you know, um, the old drunk me would never have, you know, we would have never have hooked up. But meeting my wife basically, I think, slowed down that um, sort of public uh, acknowledgement of who I am. Partly because, you know, when you meet anyone, you present what you decide of you, you think they want to see. And that didn't include you yet. And so I put things on hold for some time. I didn't go backwards. I've never gone backwards to alcohol. I've never gone backwards to um, uh, cigarettes. Although food is still it's something of an issue for me, you know. I used to eat too much. I know that. Um, it took me a very long time after that. And I've, I've talked about in a previous video about how I communicated um, about Juliet to some family members, including my immediate family, and this was a. Um, you know, a big sort of delay for me, uh, but I went from sort of self-destructive behaviour to internalising everything, but at least um, publicly acknowledging my symptoms, the reasons why I, I did some things. Um, I lent on food as, a, as my, my crutch going forward, um, ate too much, it wasn't really exercising, I would sort of binge and then, you know, I'd eat nothing but cereal for three days. Then I'd binge and eat nothing but cereal for three days. You know, not very healthy behaviour. But it allowed me to maintain a decentish weight. I'm going to back it down a bit. Um, and that was my life then for about the next eight years. Quite a, um, quite a hidden existence. And then, over time, this whole thing just came back up. To the point where it could no longer be um, be denied. And I've, I've missed out on probably 15 to 17 years of what could have been fun, open, healthy expression of who I am. And I guess if I was to say to, to anyone, um, these days, any kind of advice whatsoever, I think the only advice I would give to people is that Acknowledging your symptoms, acknowledging the the consequences of how you internalise your, um, uh, you know, any sort of um, sadness or depression that you have about um, who you are as a person. For me, that was a good way to start. 
um, was to try to um, at least be honest about something, be honest about um, how you feel, how you're coping. Even if you can't be honest about why, or you don't feel you can be honest about why you have these feelings, how you feel, for me that was a real watershed moment. And it was something that I, um, I hadn't, I didn't do consciously. I muddled my way through this. I didn't get a lot of outside help. Like I said, I phoned Samaritans, I phoned AA twice. I didn't go to AA, I didn't get a lot of outside help. I didn't go to counselling. I worked almost all this out for myself, um, as, I'm, as I am wont to do. Um, but I found, I found my way through this. I think I wasted a lot of years as a result when I could have reached out. And if I was going to give any advice to anyone who has anything in their life that is in any way similar to this, it's that the world we live in today, even 15, 20 years on from then, there are so many easier ways to access help and support through the internet that if there's anything you wanted to, to reach out about, finding a stranger, someone anonymous to talk to about it, for me was the, 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 the greatest single thing I did to be able to start saying to someone else the things and the fears and the thoughts that I kept in my head. And being able to do that, and I don't mean typing it on the internet, I mean having a conversation. Typing something on the internet didn't, yeah, that wouldn't have worked for me. Having a conversation with someone, uh, someone who was there to listen, um, was for me a, um, a fantastic resource. And therefore, whilst I, I feel like I didn't go through with those services, like the Alcoholics Anonymous, what they provided to me was enough to start me on a path that was positive. And for that, I have nothing but the greatest amount of thanks to them. And even though I don't necessarily believe in some of the things that they teach, some of their philosophies, I can't deny that the service they provided to me was, as much as I was willing to accept it, was everything I needed at the time. And yeah, they have my thanks. As do the Samaritans for patiently listening to the ramblings of a drunk man who frankly shouldn't have been wasting their time. Um, but again, they were, they were supportive and um, for that they have my thanks too. So that's kind of a bit of backstory about me. That's how I came to be as I am today. It's a lot about how I, um, how, how my sort of life um, transpired. Um, I think if anyone out there is having any issues related to, to alcoholism, or if you've got any concerns about your drinking, my advice would be to to try to reach out, to talk to someone about why it is that you drink. Um, the resources are out there are really, really good. Um, I have always struggled to give people advice on this because if I'm honest, I didn't do, I didn't succeed in doing anything to change who I was until I'd almost killed myself. Until I'd got to the point of desperation and basically I drank my life's worth of alcohol and I acknowledge that. If someone hasn't reached that point, I, I don't know what advice I could have that would, would really help them, but I would say that um, if there's anyone you know, or a stranger, like I said, someone like Alcoholics Anonymous that you can call, and you can start to talk about why it is that you feel the way you do, particularly why you, you feel the need to express this in this way, and 
what alcohol is a crutch for, because it is a crutch. And for some people like myself, it's the way you cope. It's the thing that, um, that, that helps you survive the day or the night. You know, drowns out the um, drowns out the sorrows, drowns out the um, the concerns, the day to day problems that you're facing, and it leaves you in a you now until you wake up with a cracking hangover. It um, yeah, for me, it just got me through very very lonely nights. Um, so that's. My backstory. I wanted to talk about this because it's something that um, I talk about openly in my home life. I, when someone asks me, you know, if I refuse a drink, I'm very happy to tell people it's because I'm alcoholic. And um, as you will know from some previous videos I've done, when I did some, um, a few, had an opportunity to do a few uh, live streams, I drink non alcoholic sparkling wine, I drink non alcoholic beer these days. Um, and I'm in a position where, you know, maybe I could moderate my drinking, but I choose to never drink again because I don't trust myself and I don't ever want to go back to the way things used to be, you know, I'm in a much better place now than I ever was. So that's my, um, my sort of story of alcohol. If anyone out there has any questions they want to ask me, if you don't want to ask me in the context of this um, this video, then by all means feel free to send me a private message. Um, you can either do that through YouTube, um, or because I'm on Flickr, you can also send me a mail through Flickr. Um, I'm also on TV Chicks, um, tvchicks.com. So if anyone wants to find me, I'm there basically everywhere as Juliette Noir, so you should be able to find me fairly easily. Um, if anyone wanted to to ask any questions or to talk about anything in relation to alcohol, um, I'm more than happy to um, to try and talk through any issues or discuss anything that is particularly affecting you. Like I said, my my views on this are extremely personal. They are entirely based on my experience. Um, but you know, I'm I'm always more than um, more than happy to try to give back some of the support that was given to me when I was I was younger. So nice serious topic. Probably do a few more fun things in a minute. I uh, hope that was of use to some people out there. And um, you know, if this sparks a debate, fantastic. I hope everyone's well, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Oh, the last thing I did mention in a previous video was talking about um, health issues. Uh, I still live with my gout. The gout comes back too much if I eat. So uh, I can't eat too much. Um, so if I overeat, overindulge, I've made myself susceptible to gout for life. And gout is basically what's stopping me from running at the moment. So I don't know what's triggered it. I'm a bit stuck with that one. Um, but now I can get it just based on food. I don't have to drink. I can just get it from certain types of food. Normally for me, just general overindulgence will do it for me. So I've got that at the moment and it's not going away. So that's what's stopping me from running. It's what's particularly making it painful to get my feet into nice high heel shoes. And it's also stopping me from going out, um, having fun and enjoying myself with uh, friends. So all in all, um, you know, you can make changes to your lifestyle, but some things are permanent. Um, Gout's a nice permanent reminder that um, I screwed up my 20s. There we go. Anyway, let me talk to you again. I hope this will be useful to some people. Leave me some comments if you want to. And if you don't want to comment here and you just want to message me, like I said, find me on some other place and send me a private message. I'll be happy to talk to you about things. Okay, take care and talk soon. Bye. Bye.